everybody, and welcome again uh, to another another session with uh, with me, Alex Grichuin. Um, of course, a little bit about me: I'm the, the director for Advanced Lung and Heart Disease at HRN, where we provide pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. So, uh, of course, in a virtual means. All right. So uh, let's start out with uh, talking about stress management. Uh, a lot of people that come into a, a program, or people that have, you know, just you know, like let's say they have a uh, problem with their lungs, problem with the heart, maybe a problem with their hip, or uh, there's a lot of people that come in usually into the program with high anxiety, okay? Like a lot of anxiety. And how much oxygen is pulled out from the brain at any given time without anxiety and, and all that stuff? How much does the brain need every time you breathe? 30%. Heart is 20%, brain is 30%. The three organs that consume the most amount of oxygen is your liver, heart, and your brain. Now, if you have an anxiety attack and your brain's overworking itself, you might be out of breath just because the very good, Karen, uh, you might be out of breath by overthinking. Uh, you know, may, basically your brain's just working super hard. So um, we're going to go over some uh, stress management techniques today on our first exercise or our exercise for today. So on stress management, what is stress management? Well, that kind of goes without saying. My job is to decrease or try to manage my stress level. Okay, good morning, Jackie. Good morning, everybody. So let's look at one, well, let's not even use the board right now. Let's not use the board. Let's, let's just talk really quick. So if I am very anxious and I'm about to go outside and endure exercise, meaning walking, it's not like I'm just rolling up my sleeves, putting on my sweatsuit and going for a jog every time I go outside. Anytime you walk, it's still considered an exercise if it's increasing your heart rate and it's, you could do it for a long period of time. How long uh, do we have to endure an exercise for it to be beneficial? Does anybody know? It's about 15 minutes. We prefer 30 minutes, but if somebody can exercise any given point, if they can exercise for at least 15 minutes or more, then that's a good exercise. Uh, you could do it when you're older. It's, um, it's not very expensive to do. Walking is not very expensive to do, you know. Uh, it just takes some time, so that's probably the only expenditure you need. Is it safe? Is it affordable? Yes. Can you do it inside? Of course. You can do it in a mall. You can, you know, just walking. So I'm just picking walking, you know, just right now. But anything that can increase your heart rate by at least 10 beats and you can do it for a long period of time, it would be considered a good exercise. But remember, that is still subjective. It's, it's, if you don't feel walking is a great exercise, pick something that's more suitable, but something that can still increase your heart rate. Okay, so when it comes to stress, let's go over some e a really easy technique. If everyone can do me a big favor is, I hope everyone's sitting down right now watching me. Let's do this together, okay? It would be preferable if there is no other audio, like meaning your radio is not on, your television is not on, no one's talking very loud in the background. Make sure the room that you're in, that, that you're about to do stress management in, that it is calm and relaxed. No talking, no disruptions whatsoever. I can't have any divided attention. So undivided attention will be preferable, especially for this. Uh, for this. So first thing, we're going to sit up nice and straight. Let's everybody right now take a deep breath in. Deep, really deep. Now exhale. Okay. This time I want you to close your eyes. Okay. Go ahead and close your eyes. No matter what, do not open them. That, or else you're going to... The stress management session that I'm about to do with you probably won't be any good unless you keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes shut no matter what, okay? So go ahead and close your eyes right now and just breathe in really deep, okay? Now, when you're, while your eyes are closed right now, which they should be right now, as your eyes are closed, what I want you to do is when you breathe in, I want you to pretend you're bringing in positive energy. Just pretend that when you inhale that air into your lungs, it's positive energy. Just pretend it's positive energy. So you're filling up, filling up your body with positive energy, and as you exhale, you're getting rid of the stress. You're getting rid of anxiety. Just pretend. I know it sounds silly, but just work with me on this. So go ahead and breathe in nice and deep. Keep your eyes closed. Breathe in. 
Filling up your lungs with positive energy. Exhale. The negative. So every time you exhale, pretend you are feeling lighter. Like all that stress is actually coming out in that one breath. And when it comes out in that one breath, you don't remember it again. Just pretend. Okay. Go ahead and breathe in again, nice and deep. Remember, you need concentration fuel. You need that oxygen going into your brain to make sure we're breathing in deep enough to supply plenty of it because right now your brain is going to want this. It's going to want this to happen. It needs stress management. It needs to de-stress. So go ahead and breathe in nice and deep. Now, when you breathe in deep, filling up your body with pure positive energy, exhale the negative. When you breathe in this time, take another deep breath in. Now, I want you to visualize the number three. Okay, visualize the number three. So just bright lettering. You're not seeing anything else while your eyes are shut. So while your eyes are closed, you're visualizing the number three. Now exhale all the negative energy out. Breathe all the way out, all the way out. Now breathe in again. Keep your eyes closed. Breathe in again. Now look at the number two. Now exhale all negative energies out. Breathe all the way out. Keep your eyes closed. Do not open them. Breathe in again. Now look at the number one. Exhale. All negative energies out. Relax. Breathe in again. One more time. Nice and deep. Nice and deep. Now look at the word calm. C-A-L-M. That's all you're seeing with your eyes closed. You're painting the image. Breathe out. Calm. As of now, I am calm. Breathe in again. Visualize the number three. Three. Exhale. Breathe in again. Look at the number two. Exhale. Negative energies out. Breathe out. Breathe in again. Look at the number one. Exhale. Breathe in again. Now look at the word calm. C-A-L-M. As of now, I am calm. Relax. Go ahead and open up your eyes. Okay. So that's step one. Okay. Stress management should be reducing stress. What I'm doing is I'm keeping my eyes closed. Now, on a normal stress management session, what I would usually do is I will play ambient music, sound, just regular sound you'll hear out in the wilderness or outside or something like that. It could be traffic. Some people that live in the city, they, they can sleep with like that. Like I used to live in the city and, and cars driving back and forth and everything. That was normal. That, that put me to sleep. But you take somebody that lives in the suburbs, they probably won't like the sound of city noise, you know, honking and traffic and stuff like that. And so just pick a sound that you like the best. It can be any type of sound. You can pick bird songs. You can go outside, listen. Okay. The point is on this is when you're keeping your eyes shut, do not ever open them. So you have to give yourself at least 10 minutes. If not, possibly try to go for 15 minutes and it would be best if it was 20 minutes you're spending 20 minutes out of a day to reduce your stress, let's say. So out of the 20 minutes, you, you would, let's say, let's, let's, let's pick one, okay? So let's say my stress management session, I'm going to go outside. The weather's okay. The weather's perfect, right? I go outside. I sit down. Uh, let's say I sit down on a bench, a park bench or something. I keep my eyes closed. I breathe in. I look at the visualize the number three. Exhale the negative energy out. Breathe in positive energy look at the number two exhale the negative energy out keep all why all all of which i'm keeping my eyes closed the whole time i will not open my eyes i breathe out breathe back in look at the number one exhale then breathe in again look at the word calm now that sets you up okay so as soon as you have you visualize the word calm c-a-l-m and you see that in your eye in your in front of your eyelids like in behind your eyelids as your eyes are closed Okay, you can start the process of stress management. So once I've gotten through that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my eyes closed. All I have to do is just breathe in. That's it. 
That's all I have to do. So first, I, I'm, I'm outside. I'm on the park bench. The weather's nice. Okay. Now, as my eyes are closed, I go through the, the you know, setting myself in place first, which is the three, two, one, calm. Afterwards, I'll keep my eyes closed, just breathing in nice and deep, and I'll listen. Okay, there's a big point to this. I'll start listening. I hear a bird chirping on my, let's say, my top right, let's say top right tree, and just pretend. If you don't know what kind of bird it is, don't open your eyes. Keep your mind guessing. Okay, there's a big point, but you're going to miss it if you skip out. So I keep my eyes closed. I hear a bird chirping. I pretend, I think it's a sparrow. Uh, it's up in a tree. It's in a nest. And even that's not true. That's okay. Okay, let's say I hear a car driving by me. I'm going to figure out what type, type of car that is. Maybe a truck, maybe a vehicle, maybe a van, whatever the case may be. You know, maybe a semi. Just picture it in your head. Paint the image in your brain. Let your brain paint the image. Okay, concentrate, and, and I mean concentrate a lot. Okay, keep your mind active, letting your mind create the canvas, create the picture, painting the picture. If I hear a car driving by, I'm going to pretend how many, car, how many people are in that car and which direction they're going. Okay, if I hear a bird chirping, if I, uh, if I hear a plane coming over me, I'll just keep my mind active, pretending I'm either in the plane or maybe I'm just listening, or the point is, at the, at the end of 20 minutes, the end of 20 minutes, this is the big takeaway on this, that at the end of 20 minutes, as you are literally trying to paint that image, making that scenery as realistic as possible. For instance, like, let's say I was, I'm at a park bench, but I'm pretending I am at the ocean, okay? When I breathe in through my nose, I should be smelling salty sea air, Okay, if I put my feet onto the grass and I dig in, I'm going to pretend I'm digging it into sand. Okay, I'm going to try to make this as realistic as possible to me. The point of this is, is that for the moment of, let's say I did this for 15 minutes, for a moment of 15 minutes, my, my brain could not have been concentrating on stress. It was too concentrating. It was concentrating too much of making that image I'm trying to create in my head into a reality. So a moment of 15 minutes, you could not have been stressed out because your brain was too overwhelmed of making that scenery in your head a reality. That's stress management. Anybody could go outside, sit down, and just close their eyes and listen. Just don't do this in traffic, of course. But unless, well, no, don't do it in traffic. You know, <laughs> somebody's talking by, anyways, you don't want to close your eyes in traffic. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't call to get into an accident. Yeah, don't, no, don't get in an accident, so don't, don't, don't do this in traffic. Don't do this in the car, <laughs> unless the car is stopped and it's parked and it's, uh, the, you know, emergency brakes are on and then everything and the car's off, you know, vehicle's off. So anyways, uh, you can do this any time to de-stress, okay? It might sound silly, like, why would I do that? I do that all the time, I think, you know? No, you don't, because if you're stressed out, you're, you don't have a good control of your stress. You don't have a good control of your anxiety. Let's use the board really quick here. Let's use the board here. <clears throat> Let's say I'm stressed about going upstairs. This is how I would approach it. Okay. I'm stressed about going upstairs. So here I am. Okay. So I'm stressed about going upstairs. I'm worried. Okay, I'm worried. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm worried. Okay, I'm worried about going upstairs because last time I went upstairs, it was questionable. I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. I felt like I was going into an attack or I felt like I was, I had to call 911, whatever the case may be. So I'm about to go upstairs and I'm very anxious by looking at the top. So I know if I try to climb or I have my patient climb the stairs all the way to the top, their anxiety is going to be triggered probably a hundredfold. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's possible. So instead of having my patient walk and climb all those stairs, I'm going to have them go up one or two flights of stairs only. I mean, one, two steps. That's it. And then I'll have them go back down. Okay. If this equals, let's say, one, two, three, four steps. And it's the top that gets that triggers the anxiety. Then I'll have that person go up one, two, 
come back down, go one, two, because their trigger is their mind is focused at, hey, that top is makes me oh, makes me feel out of breath, not the bottom. All right, well, go up one or two. That's not going to get me out of breath. Good. Okay. They come back down, go back up, and they just completed four steps, just like if they did four steps trigger the anxiety, but in this case it didn't. Because, and did they do it continuously? Sure. They went, you know, the person went up two steps, came back down, and walked back up again. Completed the equivalent of four steps. Okay. It was 14 steps, same exact thing. How do we climb the steps anyways? Does anybody remember how we... Excuse me. I have allergies. <coughs> Excuse me. Woo! All right. Good sneeze. I like good sneezes. Anyways, <laughs> you probably have to take a Neil Metterin's kit. Oh, another note uh, for those that don't know, if you have a nebulizer, as you know, it's a, it's a you know, nebulizer, it's a delivery device. Uh, so let's say you had albuterol in it and you want to get into your lungs, but your nasal passages are a little stuffed up or maybe runny. Okay, take your nebulizer and put it underneath your nose, breathe in through your nose, it'll still get into your lungs, okay, the medication will still get into your lungs, but the first place it's going to hit is your nose. It'll dilate that, your nose, your nasal passages, it'll dilate that, making it easier to breathe. Well, it happened about five minutes in, because that's the five minutes is the full set of, on, yeah, of, of the onset. Remember, it's a dilator, okay, but anyways, um, so if I had that, I would definitely be using it right now for my nose. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and my sort, uh, my 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 throat is probably feeling maybe sore. What should I do? I'm not. This is allergies. This is. Uh, but let's pretend I have a sore throat. All right, Diane, you're working on the steps. I love it. Uh, but uh, I, I'm just throwing a curveball here. If I have a sore throat, what should I use to help it? If I have a sore throat. So if I have a sore throat, I would recommend writing this down if, uh, if you have something to write down with. So if I have a sore throat, it is one packet, one packet of Jello mix. Oops. One packet of Jello mix. Two tablespoons of honey. Yes. No. <laughs> she said honey. I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Come on. All right. Two tablespoons of honey. <laughs> so two tablespoons of honey. Well, you know, two tablespoons of honey. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, that does, uh, you know, that could do uh, something. But uh, let's look at a old remedy that actually works very, very, very well. So I got one packet of Jello mix. It doesn't matter if it's cherry, strawberry. It doesn't matter. It's just a Jello mix. Two tablespoons of honey, and then you would put that let's say into a container and you would let's say if the packet requires one cup of water just put one cup of warm water in there make sure it's not solidified so you're not going to put that into the fridge okay you're going to drink this warm what happens is so let's say you have the one packet and you got some you know you filled it up a little bit with water with one cup of water two tablespoons of honey one packet of the jello mix stir it up the honey is going to act as an antibiotic. It's a very low, mild one, but it does work. The Jello mix, well, the sore throat, with the sore throat, when you drink that, it's going to coat the area with the Jello. It's going to coat the area that's sore. The honey mixed in with it is going to basically help any bacteria, anything that might be causing it. Remember, it's not a severe form, but it does work. So what I mean by severe, it's not a severe medication, meaning it's not a medication. It's honey that you're using as an antibiotic, you know. It's just a low, it, 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 you know, it's not something that's severe, you know. So anyways, 
two tablespoons of honey, one packet of Jello. You drink that slowly, just drink it while it's still warm. Make sure it's not cold, but make sure it's not boiling hot. You know, just make sure it's, it's, you're able to drink it, okay? But just make sure it's not cold. <laughs> Anyways, packet of Jello, two tablespoons of honey, put it in a one cup of water, warm, uh, very warm water, drink it. And uh, yeah, that'll actually do a pretty good. Uh, they'll do a pretty good job. Now, some of those lemon gargling with salt water, um, you know, you can do that. But this is literally my first step before I go with anything else. That's usually mine. It doesn't mean mine's perfect. It just I didn't make this up. This is an old remedy back in the day. What they used to do when they didn't have, uh, or it was difficult to go to hospitals back in the day. Yeah, Diane's got. A million uh, remedies coming up here. <laughs> She's got lemon, honey. All right. So when we're climbing stairs, how do we climb up the stairs? So remember what? Yes, one on one, right? So, so I'm at the front of the stairs. Okay. So do I go inhale and then move up to the next step? Exhale? No. It's first things first. You want to purse lip breathe for how long? Ten seconds. So I purse lip breathe for 10 seconds the proper way. I'm not just breathing, I purse lip breathe, okay? If I'm gonna go somewhere, I carry my purse, right? So I purse lip breathe, I'm joking, but <laughs> I purse lip breathe, right? I take my purse. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> More dad jokes. Here it works. <laughs> it, wor it works. So, all right. So I take up one. So I first, first thing I do, I purse lip breathe. I keep my mental scale. What, what is that scale? That board scale. Remember, talk test. Um, you can, uh, the more words you can say, the less out of breath you are. So if you can say three or more words, you keep going, right? If you can only say two words or one word every breath, like, I can't catch. If you're like that, you're too out of breath. It's too much, right? So anyways, keep that mental uh, scale in your head. As you go upstairs, it's one step at a time. Inhale on the first step, exhale on the same step. Then you move to the next step. Inhale, exhale. Next step, inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Let's do that together, everybody. Okay, you can do this standing if you want, but it's, it works sitting down. Take one step, inhale. Fill up your lungs. Too shallow, make sure we're filling up our lungs how deep? At least halfway. At least halfway. Your cast name is Honey? <laughs> Well, that's perfect. <laughs> oh, my. oh, I can keep going. I can totally keep going. Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <You know>? <coughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah. Woo! You're choking on those dad jokes. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> so one step, inhale, same step, exhale, move to the next step, inhale, exhale. Now, when we take one step, we fill up our lungs, right? How much? halfway fill up your lungs halfway don't breathe shallow you're not a a kitty cat <laughs> i had to keep going sorry i had to throw that one out you're not a kitty cat so what i'm trying to say is don't breathe in shallow to to fuel a human body with a small volume you know you want to fill up your lungs at least halfway so one step inhale one step exhale See, Mary, Mary gets it. She's, she's laughing at it. Inhale. Don't encourage him, Mary. I'm getting in trouble here. Inhale. Mary, do not exhale. encourage this. Inhale. Exhale. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Okay. And as your pace increases, does that mean your respiratory rate has to increase since you're looking at your steps? So if I'm moving this fast, should I be breathing that fast? Yes. You're not going to hyperventilate like that if you're walking. Okay. Yeah, the more so look another way to look at it is kind of looking at your what? Looking at what? So I'm exercising my heart rate's up, looking at your heart rate. The higher your heart rate is, the higher the what? The CO2 is, right? So by looking at your heart rate, if you have a higher heart rate, let's say your normal heart rate's 70, 80 beats per minute. And now it's like 110, 120. Well, that means your CO2 level is a little up, a little heightened, and that's good. That's a good thing. You know, that's okay. As long as we are breathing with the exercise, right? So inhale, exhale. As your pace increases, yes. As your pace increases, your respiratory rate will increase. Inhale, exhale. That's simple. Okay? As you slow down, your respiratory rate shouldn't be as aggressive. As I'm sitting down resting, 
my respiratory rate should be around 12 to 20 breaths per minute. It's not that complicated. You know, that means I have to breathe all the time, right? 12 to 20, yes. So don't slow your breathing down. That's the worst thing you could do. That'll make you sad, all right? Well, I'm actually glad you brought up CO2 uh, so we can transition into our main topic for today, which is hypercapnia. Hypercapnia, yeah. And that could be catastrophic. Catastrophe. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, I got him. Look, look, look what he's doing. Look what he's doing. Look what he's doing. He's, so, he's like, what are you talking about? I like five. Look, 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 at, look at John right now. <laughs> I had to, John. I had to. It was too funny if I didn't. I totally had to. <laughs> oh, my god! It's a catastrophe. <laughs> I hope you're proud of yourself. I am. I'm totally going to write this one up. <laughs> this is awesome. All right. So uh, let's, let's, let's go in. Let's go in. All right. Let's Mary, go in you're this. encouraging this. Saying <laughs> laughter is good for the lungs. Keep it going, Mary. Don't worry about what he says. <laughs> All right, so, all right, let's look at, okay, hypercapnia. So what is hypercapnia? Hypercapnia is the heightening of CO2, okay? And yes, it can be catastrophic. <laughs> but uh, hypercapnia is the production of increase in CO2. So usually the oxyhemoglobins or, you know, where your red blood cells, uh, like in the blood plasma and in the blood, you have CO2 increase. So blood plasma is just a fluid behind like in the blood like if you just look at blood it's red but if you look at microscopically you have clear fluid which is the plasma and then you have the red platelets and blood and uh and the red blood cells in there so thank you that's it mary attack them get them get them get take care of my late work <laughs> so all right so what is hypercapnia uh, do in the body uh well let's look at symptoms of hypercapnia if you have a chronic situation where your CO2 is a little bit heightened, you know, uh, disorientation, uh, those symptoms, uh, uh, disorientation, uh, forgetfulness is, is actually very common. Uh, sleepiness, like somebody sleeps throughout the whole day uh, or sleeps periodically, let's say like once every hour for 20 minutes, you know, and they sleep for 20 minutes, they wake up. So you'll find people like that. And that's usually what you'll have. You, you have people suffering from hypercapnia. Uh, COPD is a, a large contributor, contributor of it. Uh, when you have COPD, it's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, right? COPD. So there's a heightening of CO2, right? On blood gases, for people that don't know on blood gases. So on blood gases, um, this is what I would see in hypercapnia. Okay, if you ever looked at your own blood gases, the results, this is, I'm bringing this up right now. So you have your pH. Okay, then besides the pH, uh, let's just put a line there. So you have your pH, you have your CO2, you have your oxygen, you have your HCO negative three, which is your bicarbonate. I could put base access, but don't worry about that too much. So these are the major gases that we look at in the blood. Okay, so let's take somebody a normal blood gas. pH it should be around, this is for normal. Normal pH is around 7.35 to 7.45. Anything within that range is fine. CO2, CO2 and pH are, dire are directly re uh, related to each other. When CO2 climbs up, pH drops. When CO2 drops, pH climbs. Okay, they're proportional to each other. So CO2 is 35 to 45. O2 is 80 to 100, okay? Uh, bicarbonate is 22 to 26 moles per liter. Okay, so that's normal. These are within normal ranges. So let's take a look at somebody with hypercapnia. Uh, let's say you went to the hospital with acute on chronic respiratory failure. So usually, if you went to the hospital with acute on chronic respiratory failure, I would see results like this. Let's say, I would say, let's put it pretty radical. Let's say six, <laughs> put 6.7. Let's say it's 6.7, which is very bad, by the way. 
Uh, let's say, let's see, that's what 35. What dad joke did you make out of that? Huh? <laughs> said radical. 6.7 is very radical. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that means your blood is becoming very acidic. Um, the drops anymore, yeah, I mean, it, just this by itself is bad, you know. But anyways, let's say the CO2 is 56. O2, let's say it's 50. Bicarbonate, let's say it is... So we have somebody who has, let's say it's somebody with COPD. So let's say that is 31. Okay. So what happened here? Just by looking at these numbers, you can kind of understand what's happening with the person. Is this a ventilation problem or is this an oxygenation problem or is it a mixture of both? Well, oxygen, I'm not too worried about the oxygen so much. That's how we really look at that in the hospital. We're not worried about that too much. Because it's not the oxygen that will kill you, uh, uh, really. It's the CO2. People look at the oxygen. That's why I tell them, get off that pulse oximeter. Look at the heart rate, CO2. So this person uh, was not within range, OK? So pH has dropped. The person probably passed out. They weren't ventilating because oxygen is low and CO2 is high. That means the person either was suffocating to death might have drowned, but the person had a chronic situation. Bicarbonate only climbs in the body once there's an abnormality for a chronic, like let's say a chronic gas, uh, CO2. Let's say that's chronically high. Bicarbonate will take about two, three weeks to kick in to start increasing. So if this wasn't a drowning, if this was drowning, then, I mean, technically if it was drowning, I, I would still see this. But I can tell this person probably didn't drown. I mean, it's possible because the oxygen and the ventilation is not too horrible. It's not like it's 80. It's not like it's 70. The person was just breathing very shallow, causing their pH to drop. And this is, is this person uh, suffering from uh, hypercar uh, uh, is hap uh, hypercapnia? Sorry. He's yes. the expert, everyone. I know, right? <laughs> So is this person suffering from hypercapnia? Of course. Okay. All right. Now let's take somebody who has COPD and let's look at how that would look like. By the way, that would be somebody with COPD, but something else happened. Either the person was just breathing very shallow. So let's just take somebody who has COPD. What would their pH be, you think? Normal, 7.4. Okay. <coughs> CO2, let's say it's 55. Okay. Oxygen, uh, let's say it's, let's also put down 50. Okay. Is it within normal limits? No. Bicarbonate, let's say it is 30, uh, let's see, that's normal, 55, one tour each, so that's uh, 10, so that's 26, it'd be 36, so this would be 36. Okay. For the math to be right. I just like my math to be correct. So anyways. So does the person have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Well, we didn't do a pulmonary function test, but according to the blood gas, the person's pH is normal, okay? CO2 is high. Why? If the CO2 is high, why isn't this low? The bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is like baking soda. That's what bicarbonate is. So your body produces that. If you take acid and you put a bicarbonate, it will neutralize that acid. Okay, that's what's happening. So the pH isn't dropping. This person has a chronic respiratory problem. They have high CO2 chronically. This person most likely has COPD, okay, and low oxygen. So does this mean that person is not ventilating very well? Yes, and not oxygenating well. This could mean if these both are very, like this one's very high, that means I'm not exhaling enough CO2, and this is very really low, that means I'm not pulling in enough oxygen. Oxygen levels and CO2 will be very high. That's what I usually what I see with people that have um, COPD with their blood gases. Uh, when people breathe very shallow, and I try to get people not to breathe shallow because it's going to hurt them incredibly. But yes, okay. Now, let's take an acute. Let's say this was an acute side. So I would take this out, and as soon as I do that, that would drop the pH. So let's take somebody normal without COPD. Let's leave these numbers there. 
And 55, it's one tor per millimeter of mercury. So that 35 would be 27, 35, seven point, I'm sorry, six point uh, 35, because it's down by 10. So, and this would be a little bit higher. This would probably be around 72, 72. Okay, oxygen is really low. Bicarbonate, let's say it's normal, 24. Okay, so what happened to this person? pH dropped, person was suffocating. There might have been a bag over the person's head. Person jumped into water, okay. Does the person have COPD? CO2 is high, but the bicarbonate is not. That means this was an acute episode. This is something that happened very quickly. So because this is not increased, this person most likely was suffocating somehow, or maybe somebody was sitting on their chest, uh, you know, anything like that. But did the person pass out? Yes, of course the person passed out. You had that in, in November? Yeah. Okay, so we want to just keep an eye, but uh, when you're looking, if you ever get your results for your blood gases, take a look at this, okay? I'm very good with blood gases. Well, a lot of respiratory therapists should be good at blood gases, but because uh, that's our job, <laughs> part of our job, you know? So, all right, somebody normal, let's plug, out, put, plug in somebody who's normal. I'll leave this one up there. I'll take this away, and I'll take this away. Somebody normal, I would say 7.4. CO2, and let's say it's 440. Uh, oxygen, let's say it's uh, 85. Okay. Normal blood gas. That means there's nothing going on with this person. pH is fine. That's the, that's the big thing. That's, that's what I want to look at. I want to look at that pH. Now, why is the pH good? Because the CO2 is, is perfect. Okay. Oxygen, 85. That's fine. Okay. If oxygen is low, remember, we don't, look, we don't like to look at the oxygen as, as what we should be doing with you. We don't look at somebody's just their oxygen. We can see if somebody doesn't have enough oxygen in their body, you know, and might have to give them supplemental oxygen. But ox the body doesn't need a ton of it. It just it needs oxygen in there, right? It needs oxygen in the body, but it doesn't need a high fraction of inspired oxygen, meaning... Right now, the FiO2 in this room right now is 20.95 millimeters of mercury. Uh, we round up and say there's 21% of oxygen in the atmosphere. That's how much oxygen is in the room you're in. Doesn't, doesn't matter anywhere around the world. That's, that's where it's at, okay? When you increase that FiO2, so instead of 21%, let's say you, bl you bled in uh, pure oxygen, and let's say it was running in at 6 liters per minute, so on top of that, altogether, you're breathing in FiO2 roughly around 60, 40, 45, 60. So you're roughly at six liters, you're, you're almost, it's a very high oxygen content. Uh, the equation is, is liters per minute. Uh, let's see, it's liters per minute times four plus 20. That's, that's what it is. So here, let's do the math really easy here. Bring up the math right here really quick. Okay. Let's say, I want to know what my FiO2 is. So let's say it was 2 liters per minute. Okay, 2 times what? What did I say? 2 times 4, yeah. So that's going to be 8, right? 2 times 4 is 8, plus 20. It's 28. That's the FiO2 is 28 on 2 liters of oxygen. Okay, so whatever the liter is, Liters per minute, if it was five liters, if it was six liters, whatever the case may be, just times it by four plus 20, okay? I did this. Now, I put the eight there because it's two times four is eight, plus 20 is 28. So my FiO2 is 28. So let's say somebody increased their oxygen really, really high. That's a very bad thing. We don't want that to happen. But there are some people that think that, oh, I'm out of breath. Let me increase my oxygen. Out of breath isn't caused by oxygen. Why would you increase your oxygen when you're out of breath? Because it's not caused by oxygen, it's caused by CO2, not never oxygen, okay? It's never caused by oxygen. Then you get the person saying, well, Alex, let's say it was like this. Alex, why is it I am very out of breath? It's funny, I have my eraser right here, I'm using my hand. Why am I so out of breath 
when my auction levels go really far down, like when it goes really down. Let's say my auction was down to, and that's not SPO2, that's content. SPO2 is saturated percentage of auction. You get that off your pulse oximeter. This is not based off of that. This is auction content. It's the ADA gradient. So anyways, so let's say somebody's at 7.4 CO2. It, well, let's drop this down. Let's drop it to 7.1. Let's say it's 7.1, okay? It's a little further down because that normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. Let's say CO2 is 56, okay? Oxygen is low, CO2 is high. And let's say this person does have COPD, but they're also breathing a little bit shallow. It's not within normal range. That means there's something happening. Maybe the person slept uh, wrong or something. Maybe they had their BiPAP on or they didn't have it on. They had the mask on, but they forgot to turn the machine on. Let's just say something like that happened. Or the power went out. Okay? So person had sleep, ap uh, sleep apnea, let's say. Anyways, so this let's say, would be about 37. Okay. Yes. All right. Now this is good. All right. So pH is down. Person says, tells me, Alex, why am I out of breath? And my oxygen is low. Because you told me that I shouldn't feel out of breath with low oxygen. I said, first off, I don't make any of this up. This is actual facts. This is not based off of my theory. I, I can't do that. Okay. I'm a clinician. And I respond to you know, statistics, I respond to mathematic equations, I, I look at a person as a whole, you know, I, so the problem with this person here is the person has COPD, let's say, person has COPD because there's a chronic, there's something at the bicarbonate's high, that means there's a chronic situation with their CO2, so CO2 is high, okay, bicarbonate's up, meaning it's a chronic situation, but the person is not what, ventilating, Look, the reason why somebody would feel out of breath with low oxygen is not because of the oxygen, it's because of the CO2, but because the person's breathing so shallow, they're only pulling in a little bit of oxygen because they're breathing shallow like this, breathing very shallow. So they're not pulling in enough oxygen, which is going to cause your oxygen numbers to go down, and you're not exhaling enough CO2, which is going to cause your CO2 levels to be high. So you're out of breath because of the CO2, not because of the oxygen. Okay. I hope that makes sense. So here's the here's, uh, next question. Thank you, Len. Thank you. So I'm an old ICU nurse. Thank you very much, and thank you for all your services that you've done over the years. So, and don't call yourself old. It's not the age. It's the mileage. You know that. And don't say you have 100,000 miles on your side. <laughs> yes, and that is correct. We're looking at acidosis and alkalo uh, alkalosis. So when bicarbonate, so let's say... Let's, let's do a review for Len. Did I pronounce that correct? Uh, Lenny? So let, let's, let's, do, let, let's make this fun because now we have a nurse in here. I want to do a refresher. You ready? Let's do a refresher. Let's do. Come on. Let's see if we hit this out of the ballpark. You ready? All right. What if my pH is 6.5? It's not, this is not going to be math. This is just what's going on, okay? So you, you don't have to do any calculations here. Let's say the CO2 is 40 oxygen. Let's say it's normal. Let's say it's 90. Bicarbonate. Oh. Now what's the problem? CO2 is fine, so this is not a what? This is not a respiratory issue. C the CO2 is fine. So it's not a respiratory issue. pH is low, but what is that caused by? Bicarbonate's too low. Bicarbonate's too low. So what is that indicative of? Well, what does that mean? That is, come on, first one that gets it right. Come on, get, give, me, give me a problem. What do you think this might be? Let's hit it out of the ballpark. Come on, anybody? All right, this is based off of, I know Lenny knows, that I'm pretty sure it just wants to see the, uh, anybody else's answers. Is it heart? It's diabetic. This is diabetes. 
It's di yeah, di diabetes. Okay. This is a diabetic problem. This isn't a respiratory problem. Metabolic acid. Yeah. See, right there. Very good. Metabolic acidosis. Very good, Jenny. Very good. My goodness, I love it. So just to confirm, Alex, you're saying that you don't need a lung disease in order to, in order to suffer from hypo, uh, yeah, hypercapnia. Yeah. Well, not with hypercapnia because that is a respiratory thing, but to pass out, all you gotta have is keto acid, uh, acidosis. Very good. There we go, Lenny. I knew it's okay. I knew I'd get it right. I, I knew. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a nurse. What do you, what do you expect? I was about to say, I think she might be cheating here. Nah. <laughs> she might be cheating. All, the, so, all those years of experience. <laughs> so 6.5, okay, the pH is low because of, and that is ketoacidosis. So we look at respiratory acidosis. That means it's respiratory related. Acidosis, that's based off of the CO2, right? pH can be low, of course, because they, they work proportional with each other. CO2 climbs, pH drops. Okay, CO2 drops, pH climbs, alkalosis, okay, acidosis, all right? So they're proportional, they, they work and they're relatable to each other because you can't have a pH without the CO2, <laughs> all right? As, don't worry about the oxygen, we're worried about these. Well, specifically these because that was related to that. So we're looking at that, no cheating. <laughs> All right, no cheating, but you have an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> he just says that you have an advantage because you have all those years' experience with, uh, uh, with vents in, uh, in, 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 in the hospital, in the emergency room. But, um, okay, very good. I knew you rocked. That was awesome. I love it. All right. Oh, uh, I'm, co I'm coming off topic, I think. Am I? No, you're on topic. Am I on topic? Yeah. Uh, how do you know if, if you're suffering from hyper hypercapnia well if you're suffering uh through with hypercapnia you can really uh i mean a good understanding if you're suffering with that we, we we would have to do a blood gas to see where uh where the abnormality is you know so we would do that uh we could do an end title um an end title check to just verify before we go invasive so we will take a large syringe it's just um this is a yay long syringe and uh, usually we always go in the wrist, but uh, there are times where I, I'm not sure if you had a Lenny, uh, Lenny, but I remember I had to take a very long needle with um, somebody. I felt so bad. I felt so bad for this person. Not because I'm, I'm a very good stick. I mean, I'm very good at puncturing people and, and getting the, the artery nailed on perfect. So my strategy in a clinical, I'm not sure what your strategy is, but what I do is I put my fingers really close together and I'll put it onto the radial artery and I'll push down. If I feel bilateral movement back and forth, bilateral equal, equal pressure, then I know that, that center on where my finger meets, that center is my sweet spot. And I'll go in, of course, at a 45 degree angle, you know, and I'll pull that blood out. Or actually the blood gets filled up and then the heparin inside of the syringe. Anyways, there was a person with Down syndrome. I felt so bad for this person. But the doctors were like, Alex, you have to. I'm sorry, you have to. And I says, I have to go femoral. And I says, I know. Because uh, some people, like with, uh, uh, there are some people like that have Down syndrome that their anatomy is a little different. So this person's anatomy where the veins and arteries were supposed to be are actually in a different location. So it was hard to find the artery on the arm. We had uh, an emergency physician. Um, there was one emergency physician, and there was another, there was another doctor that didn't want to do the stick. He said, Alex, just do it because you always hit it. You know? And I, was, I haven't done a femoral stick for a long time. So I was like, I said, can, can, is there something better we can do? You know? So this poor lady is, doesn't have any idea what's going on besides she knows she was in the hospital. And... I had to take this long syringe and insert it into her femoral. We had to. Uh, there's another way to pull blood. It is the worst way. Uh, not worst way. It's, it's, a, it's a known method, but you have to go into the bone. And there is, yeah, you actually go inside the bone itself. So you take a syringe. Uh, it's a specialized syringe because if you try to take syringe and put it into a bone, it's going to capture some of that bone fragment into the syringe and it'll plug it up. Uh, but... Interoscular is another way to pull out blood. It is not fun. It is very painful. But this poor person, 
I felt really bad, but I was like, I'm going to make sure I get it first time. I don't want to keep sticking this person. I don't want any mistake to this person's going to hate me, you know, but it was necessary. It was necessary. So I had to go femoral. And when I went in femoral, I had, a, it was, it was, it, she was going through some pain. There was no doubt about that. So I try to go as fast as I can, but I have to be as accurate as possible. So I don't cause discomfort to that person. Um, but yeah, that was not a fun blood gas to do. Do you ever do that? What are oh. you saying that does hurt? Yeah, it is. It is. It is just. It's bad. When I usually do it, uh, there was a nurse. This was when I was a kid, and there was a nurse that slapped my butt. No, it, it's it's a it's a th no no. It's an actual good thing. So, um, I was about to get a, a syringe in my behind. Uh, for this type of flu shot or something. I was little. I, I, I didn't know what the heck was going on. But I remember she slapped me. She said, don't worry, I'm going to slap your butt. And I says, okay. Slap it. Whap! Then puts the needle directly in. I did not feel it whatsoever. I did not feel it. Why? Because when you slap something, what does it do? It disrupts the nerves. And they're firing because of that slap. So the next thing that punches through is this syringe, and I barely felt anything. It was the most coolest, greatest thing. I, I never realized there was techniques like that. And that was another reason I wanted to get in the medical field was because there was these awesome techniques. There was one technique. I don't know if you guys heard of this one. This technique, I thought it was the most coolest technique in the world. There was a neurologist, and I mentioned this in my class. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this in Life Eats. Uh, but if you're able to touch your fingers, okay, let's say you had a neck injury, okay, and you're able to touch your fingers. And this neurologist, uh, this is over in Holy Cross Hospital in Utah. That's, I went to school in Utah. I grew up in Maryland. But anyways, uh, I was in there, and this doctor was saying uh, this person came in with a head injury, and he was on a gurney, and uh, the doctor came over and said, can you t touch each finger? And I was curious. I was like, why? Like, why, you know, my head, I'm like, thinking, why? I wanted to go and approach that doctor, but my, um, uh, uh, the people, the staff that I was with were like, don't, don't talk to him. I said, why? And he said, the person only comes in, gets flown out for special services, and it goes to all these hospitals, this one doctor. And uh, so he's supposed to be some kind of VIP type of person, but he's very, very good, you know. So he was eating lunch. And I, you know, took my train and I had my lunch with me. I'm looking at him. Hmm. No one's sitting with you. You know, of course, there was a lot of tables that were empty. But I was like, Is anybody sitting here? Anybody sitting here? And he, he was like, no, go ahead. Sit down. I sat down. I says, hey, I have a quick question. You, do you mind like just a, a, a half a second, you know, or something like that? And he says, well, I, I, I definitely have a half a second as that already passed. I said, oh, do you have a minute? He says, no problem. Go ahead. What's your question? I said, in the ER, you told the patient to touch each finger. Why? And he says, oh, you, you haven't heard that one? I says, no. And he says, okay, well, when there's a neck injury, these five keep you alive. I was like, what do you mean? And he says, well, okay, so on your cervical, you have a lot more than five, you know, but on your cervical spine, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. I was still confused about what he was talking about. I was like, so I'm just listening to him, trying to learn and ascertain. He says, somebody had comes in with a neck injury. Let's say they could do this, they could do this, but they couldn't do that. The ring finger couldn't come in. It was shaky. It, it had a bad, you know, it just, it just wouldn't work. But every finger, every other finger worked except for that ring finger. That means that first, second, third, fourth vertebrae was fractured. Isn't that neat? These five keep you alive. If this one could move, the thumb person goes on a ventilator right away because that means the diaphragm, that's the vagal nerve. These five keep you alive. I thought that was the most coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. I was like, that is so neat. He says, yeah. And he threw something else. He, he's like, you know, when somebody has a high temperature, let's say 106, will they die? I was like, well, I would think they would. And, he, and I was a rookie back then, you know. But... The doc, he, he, it was actually really cool, you know. Everybody was like listening in because they they wish they asked questions. I just just wanted to learn. I just wanted to learn, you know. I mean, how do you become good at what you do? You model the best. 
So this doctor was like, he's like, well, you want to hear something else? I said, yeah, sure. He said, okay. Um, temperature is not what kills you. So even with somebody with 106 degrees, they wouldn't actually die from that temperature. What would they die from? Dehydration. The temperature, when it increases, uh, I believe anything past 102 degrees, don't quote me on this because I'm trying to remember from 20 years ago when I was uh, started out. But, um, yes, 20 years ago. I'm 45 years old. I know I don't look it, but that's because I shaved. I don't. Not as bad as the cat one, was it? So <laughs> No, no, it wasn't as bad as the cat one. Yeah, so uh, when the temperature goes up, well, I think it's after 102 degrees, you lose like one liter per hour of water. And uh, once you're really, I mean, when, when somebody with a high temperature, they're just diaphoretic, they're sweating uncontrollably, and then they, of course, they'll start to pass out. When you start losing a lot of blood or you start losing a lot of fluid, you get really, really cold because there's not a lot of friction happening in that body as blood's having a hard time moving past it. And, of course, it uh, goes without saying. But, uh, yeah, he said that it's not the temperature. He said, somebody has a high temperature, we're going to try to lower the temperature down, probably give them an ice bath or probably do something even better than that, than an ice bath because ice baths are not fun. Uh, but we'll give that person a lot, and I mean a lot of saline. I will insert that person a lot of saline, keep their temperatures down. Because the high temperature, what would your oxygen look like? Somebody had a high temperature, what would their oxygen look like? Nearly 100%. The affinity attraction to oxygen on a red blood cell binds very tightly with a high temperature. Meaning if you have a high temperature, how do you feel? Dizzy, disoriented, fatigued, sweating. Okay. What are those signs of? Possible signs of, I should say. Low oxygen. But your oxygen levels are about 100% saturated. If not, content is all the way up. That's because the oxygen is not leaving the blood. It's staying in the blood. It's not leaving the blood. People think, hey, just because there's oxygen in my blood, I'm good. They still have to understand that if your temperature is very high, the oxygen is not going to release off that red blood cell. There's no brain on a red blood cell. It relies on time, temperature, and pressure. Just look at and look up Gala Sachs Law, Boyle's Law, Charles Law. Any of those would be great. Uh, but... Um, Bo uh, Boyle's law, kind of time, temperature, and pressure. Anyways, that's just a lot of so before science. we before we wrap up here. Yes, uh, we have uh, one more qu one more question about hypercapnia. Uh, Please, which is how do I treat hypercapnia? How is it treated? How is it treated? Usually, a non-invasive uh, non ventilator first. We put that person on a BiPAP, CPAP, most likely a BiPAP, and uh, uh, we'll have that person on there for some time until the CO2 drops down a little bit. Uh, also, we would have to work out intercostal uh, muscle strengthening just because that person, for some reason, was breathing very shallow. They were trying to breathe in deep when they felt out of breath, and it just wasn't happening because the muscles responsible for opening up the lungs might have not been strong enough. The muscles, the ribs, and the diaphragm probably wasn't strong enough. So um, that's, yes, uh, we would definitely be doing that, but first thing, is get that person fixed, meaning put that person on a non-invasive ventilator um, first, uh, you know, do a blood gas and just double check to see if it's working. And um, we can do end title, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that off, you know, off accuracy. So uh, before, you we, on that. before we uh, yes. wrap up, uh, we'll go to our email questions, as always. Love it. Uh, and we'll answer one of them. We'll save the rest for Thursday. Uh, this question is from Mary in Baltimore, and she asks, will losing weight help my IPF? So with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, losing weight can contribute to uh, an increase in resistance just because the weight being pushed on you plus the weight of the scarring. But what would help the most is, let's say, with all that fibrosis. You know the problem with IPF the most of it is? The biggest problem with IPF is that the alveolar capillary membranes, so here you have alveoli, okay, so you have the alveolar sac. Those membranes are just very thick. So what we look at is the DLCO. If the DLCO is very low, that means oxygen is having a hard time penetrating. Gases are having a hard time penetrating through that. You know, so um, if we can thin out those membranes, it would make it easier to breathe and make it easier for gases to transport past those membranes. 
where oxygen can come into the blood and CO2 can come out into the lungs so you can breathe it out. So, uh, but you would have to thin out those membranes. So, yes, if you reduce your weight, yes, uh, of course, it would take some weight off of your lungs, uh, off your body, you know, to breathe. So it would be, yes, uh, that would help. But the major fix is lung stretches, hyperinflation therapy, um, and uh, respiratory muscle training. It's going to be the best. And also we have a video on uh, exercise and, and diet and vitamins. How will that help your IPF on our YouTube as well? Yeah, if perfect. Dr. Shaw did that um, about a week or two ago. So they can always reference that as well. Uh, Janie uh, asks, will you demonstrate strengthening exercise for shallow breathers? So we uh, we have uh, we do that at the beginning of every live stream. Do the various different exercises. Okay. Today we did stress management, Janie. So if you want, you can uh, go and take a look at uh, our um, our previous live streams after you finish this one, or you can rewind this one and learn a bit about stress management. As yeah, well. you can do that. You know, question about the valves. I have a stent in my carotid artery. Does this mean that I don't have a nickel allergy? I don't know how to answer that. I don't want to give you a bad answer, but I don't know how to answer that. Um, I would have to ask Dr. Shaw on that one. I don't know that because I, there's two things jumping in my head, but I don't, like I said, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. I don't know because, like, the reason why I don't know that is nickel allergy and the stent, it, it does have some metal in there. Um, it's a spring load, and uh, I know we have a sample very 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 small and anyways they insert into a carina to keep that spot open in your lungs but uh, i would have to ask about the nickel allergy thing i would have to ask so i'll get back to you on that karen but i would have to ask i don't want to give a bad answer great question but it's something i don't know um it might be a good idea for her to ask her primary as well yeah probably ask her primary doctor as well but i, I would have to ask just be, I, I, like I said, I don't want to give you anybody here bad answers. I don't want to give you inaccurate information. My immunologist tested me for the nickel allergy. He tested me on the one used in the valves. I got you, Mary. Um, huh? Like I said, I have to double check on that because that's the first time I'm hearing about that. Um, I haven't heard that one yet, except now, of course. Uh, any other questions? No. Everyone get a Delta V. I love it. Keep it going. Delta V's, guys. You if can you want the best follow. device, Delta V is the best device. That is not a joke. They that can is. also follow Delta V, uh, the company Facebook, on the company Facebook page. Yeah, and try to f uh, follow us on the Delta V website, uh, on our Delta V uh, support site on Facebook. Just type in Delta V, take a look at it, and it's, yeah, it's follow us on that, because we'll, we'll have uh, videos on that, too. Um, as well as some support and education behind that. As well as My New Lungs, our YouTube channel, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Absolutely. But that's all the time we have for today, guys. Thank you very much for joining. I hope you guys try some of the techniques, and I hope you learned a lot. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.